everyone. Thank you for having me. I'm really happy to be able to be here with you today, even if only on the screen in a virtual format. Today I will be talking about a topic that is really exciting for me, which is edge computing. I will be focusing on the current requirements and challenges, but not just that. Also, we'll be looking into the solution side and I will introduce you an open source cloud platform that is fine-tuned for edge and IoT use cases. So uh, stay tuned. Before deep diving into the content, let me introduce myself first. My name is Ildi Kovancha. I work as Senior Manager of Community and Ecosystem um, at the Open Infrastructure Foundation. You can find um, some of my contact info on the slide. So if you have any questions or if you would like to follow up on any of the topics that I touch on today, please feel free to reach out to me in email or direct message me on Twitter or other social media or chat platforms where you might be able to find me. Let me assure you, I'm on a lot of them. So um, now let's dive into the more exciting part um, and let's start with edge computing. As I mentioned, um, I would like to touch on some of the current challenges and requirements in this space. And for that, let me start with introducing a few use cases just to really get a fuller picture of what we are dealing with here today. What I brought you first is telecommunications and 5G, which might be a little bit surprising in terms of in a lot of areas, if you have a 5G capable phone, you often see the little um, sign in the top left or right corner that your phone is already utilizing a 5G network where it might be already available. The reason why I wanted to still bring back telecommunications into the spotlight is, uh, well, multiple reasons. Telecom operators really are pioneers in the edge computing space. And the reason for that is that edge computing is highly dependent on one single thing, which is connectivity. If you think about an end-to-end -end edge infrastructure as a graph uh, where you have to have connection uh, between the nodes, um, then you really do recognize how much pressure there is on telecom operators to provide that connectivity to you so that you can say that, yes, my edge is really truly is on the, on the edge of a network. And now if you look into the environment, um, how the telecom networks look like, and I'm talking about the backbone infrastructure. If you look at the diagram on the slide, you will see uh, the end-to-end -end kind of an onion-like um, architecture with the, uh, the central data center, the large uh, central site. And from there, the regional sites, like a central office uh, type of configuration, out to the aggregation and then the access edge layers, where we are getting towards the radio towers and the small set-top boxes in your home. And now, edge computing makes it possible to use the cloud computing principles and values and concepts even within your home. So those small set-top boxes are now utilizing the hardware resources um, that's available in them way more efficiently than ever before, which provides the opportunity for telecom operators not just to provide the basic connectivity for you to be able to run your edge computing use case, but also for them to turn their infrastructure into a service that they could not offer before. Now it all sounds um, kind of simple, isn't it? Just tweaking on the infrastructure a little and then we're all set. However, if you take a closer look and really just observe the scale and the geographically distributed nature of these edge computing end-to-end -end infrastructures and environments, then, then you will see that it really is a challenge to be able to deploy, manage, and orchestrate just the infrastructure services themselves, not to mention the application layer on top of it. 
And if you also take this a step further and just think about how many edge computing use cases require special hardware, hardware acceleration, even software acceleration pieces, um, how all these hardware components are coming from different vendors, um, also the infrastructure software pieces are usually delivered by different vendors and then the application vendors are trying to put their little pieces on top of all this. So you have to be able to integrate the whole system end to end and the system has to be able to further grow sort of organically and again how do you manage and operate this once the infrastructure is already deployed? So this sort of, as the telecommunication um, industry calls it, day two operations is really what is causing a lot of headaches currently. To look into all this from a slightly different angle, I also brought you another use case that is industrial IoT. So factory floors um, are going through not just the automation phase, but also the digitalization phase. They are turning into smaller or larger cloud environments. So uh, this is what we are calling Industry 4.0 and Industry 5.0. The next wave of innovation is already around the corner as well. So if you look into the factory floors, you will see sometimes slightly different requirements because the safety of both humans as well as the equipment on the factory floor is most important, uh, really crucial to be able to provide. And at, at the same time, you also have to be able to run all the operations efficiently. Uh, factory floors often have requirements such as uh, being able to run mission critical workloads with real time requirements. Um, you also usually need really high bandwidth locally. So this is how a factory floor is turning into an edge computing use case. And often when we are talking about big corporations with multiple factories, they want to be able to connect all these together to be able to run different analytics to see how they can um, turn the operation and the machinery to be even more efficient in each and every single factory. So running analytics on an aggregated data centrally. But again, um, when you're looking, we're looking into the industrial IoT use case and just the number of sensors, industrial PCs just in one single factory, you will see how the scale really affects um, the use case and the infrastructure itself. So how do you manage all those pieces all together? How you uh, connect newer and older um, industrial PCs into one system? how you operate them, how you upgrade them, patch them. Um, those are really similar challenges than the large scale um, telecom environments. And if you're looking into emerging use cases like uh, green energy, how turning in solar, uh, coal and wind, uh, coal mines and uh, moving from coal into the uh, wind and solar generated more green power options. Um, so the grid here really is turning into a massively distributed systems. Like if you look into the wind turbines uh, in a couple of uh, countries in Western Europe, for instance, they have large scale deployments out there. Um, and also more and more fields are filling up with solar panels. So um, how we are really trying to look into what's best for our planet and uh, moving uh, and how we are generate energy and power that we all um, are highly uh, reliant on. So um, this is really crucial for the future of both our planet as well as the human race. So uh, when it comes to technology, we need to look into how to make that a reality. And that really provides you with the same uh, complexity and high scale uh, type of requirements and challenges. 
or connected cars, connected vehicles, really, everything is turning into a connected device, which means that um, in a couple of years, we are really, will be dealing with billions and billions of connected devices that has to be um, operating safely um, and securely. So again, you have to be able to manage all these and upgrade and patch. Robotics, I already talked about the factory floors. Um, so it's just kind of a step forward in terms of how you might want to reconfigure a robotic arm on the fly without causing any damage to the part that the, um, the arm is currently working on and yet to upgrade and change the software configuration on the robot um, at the same time. These are all really um, exciting and interesting use cases as well as really challenging ones because again for the ones that are running in production already um, just sort of simple things of how you deliver and deploy a security patch without causing any disruption to the system so the mobile phone call still, still has to go through uh, that infrastructure um, and the same backbone system that provides you with mobile data and this is really just a simple thing you would think but when you think about the number of edge sites that grows from tens to hundreds to thousands to tens of thousands and then even larger than that and the problem already becomes something that is um, much larger than you would have thought at the very beginning so one thing um, that we have to accept that these environments are really complex and complexity is not going away no matter how hard we are working on to sometimes almost reinventing uh, every single layer of a full stack uh, deployment and every component of the end-to-end -end infrastructure with the um, the driving force of simplicity, how we are how we could make our solutions simpler. But the fact is that complexity will always be uh, a part of our life and a part of the uh, the IT systems. So what we need to think about is how we tackle and how we live together with complexity, so it doesn't cause a problem for us anymore. So this is where um, things like remote management, automation um, come in, and these become crucial. How you're able to leverage new technologies and trends such as machine learning and AI to even um, use them to maintain your infrastructure and being able to do most of the steps without human intervention in an automated way. And at the same time, I also talked about organic growth within the infrastructure. So the different pieces as the infrastructure goes has to uh, fit um, in with each other. So you have to be able to add new components and uh, load new workloads on top of the infrastructure that you have. So this is where open source infrastructure with de facto standard interfaces and traditional standards come into the picture and will play a really crucial role in the infrastructure's life. And when it comes to architecture choices, I also wanted to touch on this because it is really important to, to understand that when it comes to edge computing, there really is no one size fits all solution out there. You have to be able to fine tune um, the infrastructure bits and pieces for your use case and configure them the way how you will be able to uh, utilize them the best. This means that you might have a use case where autonomy on the edge sites um, is not that crucial. So you can um, load um, the control services in the central site and uh, utilize most of the resources on the edge site to run workloads. And when a connection is lost between the central cloud and the edge site, that is okay because the workloads will keep on running um, and new functionality will not be available for 
uh, some amount of time, but the existing workloads will still be operating as expected. And once the connection is rebuilt, uh, the system will synchronize and the edge side will run with full functionality. In some cases, that is not feasible. You always have to be able to add a new user, start a new instance um, of the workload that you have, which means that you have to have autonomy at the edge side. And in this case, you want to be able to move some control services out to the edge and to every single hop um, in your multi-layer end-to-end edge infrastructure. So it means that you want to distribute those control services, which will give you some overhead in management and orchestration, as well as some resources need to be allocated on the edge as well to those control services. But again, at the same time, if you're dealing with a connection loss, you will have full autonomy on the edge. So you will be able to still have full functionality or something really, really close to that. So again, choices uh, is a centralized model uh, working for you, or you will need something that is rather distributed and providing you that autonomy on the edge. So um, this is how edge computing looks like today. We are focusing on complexity, automation, day to operations, what happens after you deployed that edge infrastructure and workloads um, and maybe you're already running them in production, how you are dealing with those day to operations and management. So um, giving you some answers, um, I will be now switching over to talking about that open source project that I mentioned to you. It is called Starting X and Starting X is a fully integrated um, cloud platform that is optimized and fine tuned for edge and IoT use cases. So what is the project all about? As I mentioned um, before, open source really is crucial for the success and uh, viability of edge computing. And uh, Starling X happens to be an open source project as well. So it's not just a cloud platform, it is also an open source community. Um, the project is supported by the Open Infrastructure Foundation and you can access the code and download it already. Um, it is under an Apache 2 license. You can grab the code or you can also grab pre-built ISO images and you can already um, download and experiment with the project. If you're looking for proof points, Starting X is already running in production at various large telecom operators around the globe. To mention examples, uh, T-Systems, Verizon, Vodafone, uh, KDDI, are all among the telecom operators who are already leveraging Starling X in their backbone infrastructure. For instance, if you're an, on a Verizon network um, in North America, um, seeing that 5G sign on your phone, uh, that means that your service is running on top of Starling X in that backbone infrastructure. And I think that this is super cool and what open source means is that if you like the software and if you're utilizing um, the software already then you can also come and participate in the community so uh, already i have a call to action for you um, to go download the software try it out and if you like it also please come and get in touch with the community and start participating to um, help maintain and enhance the software further. If you don't know Starling X yet, then um, hopefully the next couple of slides will give you a base package to understand what the software really is all about, what it provides to you, how it works, what the basic architecture is, and at the end, I will remind you how to get in touch with the community if you would like to either learn more, have more questions that you're looking for answers to, or if you're ready, uh, ready to contribute. So um, I spent quite some time on talking about what the current challenges and requirements of edge computing use cases are, especially the ones that are already running in production. So how does Starling X help you to deal with that complexity, uh, complexity? And how does this platform help you to um, be able to 
automate more within your infrastructure. If you look into the diagram here, it really is a simplistic one. And the most important part of this diagram is the um, middle-ish row that captures the, uh, the starting X services. So you can see that starting X offers you with infrastructure orchestration, as well as configuration management, fault, host, service, and software management components. And these components really are filling a gap in the current um, both open source uh, software space as well as um, often proprietary solutions with focusing on those components that will provide you with the uh, capability of fully automating the lifecycle management of your infrastructure, both hardware as well as software components. And Starling X is also looking into making it as easy as possible for you to onboard your applications and edge workloads on top of this infrastructure. The community from the very beginning is really aware of um, how edge computing use cases look like and what their demands are. So thinking about the end-to-end -end infrastructure that is geographically distributed, as well as most probably either already deployed on a large scale or will grow to a large scale in the mid to, well, long-term future. So the community is um, designing and developing the platform with these requirements um, in mind from the very beginning. And when it comes to use cases, I mentioned that the project is already running in production at large telecom operators, but the project and the platform is not fine-tuned for telco. And I also was pointing out that the telecom requirements are not necessarily that specific to um, the telecom use cases. So most of them are applicable in various industry segments as well. So you can see how Starting X is turning well-known open source components into a platform that you can use for various types of uh, use cases in various industry segments, such as I already mentioned industrial IoT and manufacturing, but you can also look into energy, retail, smart cities, healthcare, and many, many more. And when it comes to um, that end-to-end -end infrastructure, again, you are most probably very familiar with how a large data center looks like, um, how the cloud software is deployed on the servers, what the challenges and what the solutions are. But what happens when we step outside of the walls of those large data centers and you're connecting in a central office, if you're talking about the telecom environment, or uh, just a regional edge site or the um, far edge, uh, smaller edge site. So when it comes to the Starling X platform, uh, you can deploy the components in various configurations, which means that you can have a hyper-converged uh, deployment uh, on one single server on a small edge site, while if you have at least two servers, then you have the option to deploy Starling X in a highly available configuration, or you can um, also deploy the platform in a large medium edge site or in the central cloud, like a, a traditional cloud platform solution. And you can uh, connect all this into one large geographically distributed architecture, and I will be talking about later how that looks like. So um, let's go a bit deeper into the Starting X technology. I already uh, pointed your attention to uh, the Starling X components, um, you can see um, those with purple um, on this kind of uh, high-level architecture diagram, and you can also see one more um, feature uh, that is called Distributed Edge Cloud. I will be talking about that one later. It is an important one. But before going into details on that, um, I also wanted to point out all the well-known open source components that Starling X also integrates together into one cohesive platform. 
So you can see that Starling X is creating kind of a fusion between Kubernetes and OpenStack. So it is providing you with a well-known, um, mature open source cloud platform, while it is also utilizing container technologies to, pro to provide you with um, an easier management of the infrastructure services as well as the application components. So the lifecycle management of uh, both infrastructure and applications um, are becoming easier and easier. And um, beyond that, you can also see um, that you have the option to deploy Starling X with a low latency, uh, real-time Linux kernel. And when it comes to the advantage of using open source software in your infrastructure is that you um, can use a lot of already well-known interfaces and APIs. So you have the, the chance of not just looking into the API definitions um, in an open source project, but you can also look into how it is implemented. If you've been using any of these components already, then you are already familiar with it. So um, when you're deploying Starling X, most of the APIs and interfaces are ones that, that you are already using. So it is uh, a much smaller curve uh, when it comes to learning how to use the platform and the functionalities that it has to offer. And I already mentioned that Starling X is leveraging the uh, container technologies. So I really just wanted to emphasize on that um, because one big advantage of containers is that they are um, really easy to uh, deploy and redeploy as well. So if you're running infrastructure services in containers, um, that will provide you with the opportunity to really just pick and choose which component goes on which host and which server in your infrastructure, being able to quickly deploy it as one package with the dependencies built into it, and then reconfigure your infrastructure later, uh, much easier and in a much flexible way if you need that. So this is what that evolution path is all about to deploy um, all the components in containers uh, within your infrastructure on top of a host operating system. And now let's talk just a few words about the uh, infrastructure management components, uh, what the Starting X community calls the flock. So this will be those um, new starting X components that I was um, highlighting before. So let's start with host management. This practically means that the starting X platform uh, provides you with the opportunity to manage your uh, hardware, your servers through the host management component. And this component is, in, uh, is connected with uh, the other components as well. You can see on the diagram um, how it is connected to configuration faults, service and infrastructure orchestration components. So uh, with using, again, traditional well-known interfaces like the BMC in your servers, Starling X is able to provide uh, you with operations to power on and off a server. Um, and also looking into upgrading some of the uh, firmware and BIOS settings. Um, Starling X is the community as well as the Starling X platform as a solution is having a high emphasis and focus on monitoring and fault management. So you will receive an alarm if something happens in your system both uh, when it comes to the physical host as well as the software infrastructure. And um, Starling X is really focusing on providing you with a full lifecycle management of all the components in the system, which kind of points back to how I was talking about the challenge of, okay, I deployed my edge infrastructure. It is on a large scale, but everything is in place now and running. But what happens on the second day when something goes wrong or what happens on the third week when I have a new component to add to the system, um, like um, discovering a new node and being able to deploy and configure it. You really want to do all these steps uh, 
in an as automated fashion as physically, humanly, uh, virtually possible. So this is what all these components are about that um, starting X is able to discover your hardware, knowing what kind of configuration it has, being able to monitor the alarms um, so you can have preventive as well as reactive actions if something happens in your infrastructure. So the configuration management is going to the next step with that. Again, as I mentioned, discovering your node and then being able to install it uh, automatically through uh, manifest files and using Puppet and Ansible. So again, well-known um, deployment and configuration tools and components in your system, being able to decide how much of the hardware resources you want to allocate to different services and components. So uh, being able to uh, reserve components and hardware uh, resources to the control services and also um, ensure that your workloads can have in a, enough amount of resources in your system to be able to run efficiently. And at the same time, also utilizing hardware acceleration resources. When it comes to service management on, um, on top of all this, so you have your hardware, you have that configured, you have the infrastructure services and have them configured. You also want to think about how to deploy um, most of the services and components in a um, some kind of a high availability configuration. So you can choose um, configuration options to have both active as well as standby components. So this means, and it is really important, for instance, both the uh, telecommunications as well as the industrial IoT use cases that I, that I talked about, and there are other use cases where this is crucial, that if something happens to your active component, that that be a hardware or a software failure, you want to have uh, a standby to switch over to uh, almost immediately, like in telecommunication environments, there are um, strict SLA requirements. So uh, a telecom network can have up to uh, five minutes downtime throughout a whole year. It's not five minutes at every single time when something happens, it is five minutes total. So it really is not a lot, uh, long time to be able to detect what happened, switch over to uh, a standby component and being able to run the system. So what Starting X is doing for you is uh, providing you with different options to configure your system to be highly available, how you want to switch over to a component, um, a redundant server or a redundant software component, um, and at the same time, with the different configurations and options that are available, how to mitigate the, uh, the likelihood of a split brain scenario happening, so how to reduce that and avoid that from happening, um, and just being able to provide you with a stable infrastructure layer at all times. Fault management um, is the other angle which means that you will be notified uh, whenever something happens. Uh, let that be a hardware, again, or a software component failure. Um, you have access to the fault management component as well as the information either through a REST API or uh, for some more um, traditional configurations and standard solutions. Um, you can receive alarms through SNMP v3 as well. And um, why it is so important is in the large, massive scale, this uh, geographically distributed environment, you really want to be able to figure out uh, and see immediately if something went wrong. And in a large scale environment, that is not trivial how to do that. So a fault management component really is crucial to keep you informed and keep the system informed to be able to react automatically. And Starting X provides you with a single pane of glass interface where you can not just uh, follow and change the configuration of the system, but you can also, again, follow the um, 
the errors and alarms that that happens and unfortunately sometimes they just do happen so you want to have a component that is focusing on monitoring the system and providing you with the information when something happened and software management is the last component that I want to talk about here because this is the component that provides you with the ability of patching the system. So when you have a security fix, a bug fix, or just a small upgrade to, have, to get a new feature, software, the software management component is what uh, takes your patch and distributes it within the system and um, deploys it automatically. So with almost just a push of a button, you can upgrade your infrastructure without the headache of, okay, how do I deploy this one patch on my 500 or, I don't know, 5,000 edge sites maybe. So um, going into details on a few things that I already talked about, um, to give you a more detailed view, I want to touch on the container platform a little bit. Um, so if you look at the diagram, what you see here is that starting X really is using a traditional um, Kubernetes um, configuration and layout. So you have control plane services as well as worker nodes. And on the worker nodes, you will be able to use traditional um, interfaces like um, container D or um, Multus and Calico for networking. You also have access to hardware acceleration devices and your containers will be able to utilize, for instance, <clears throat> GPUs or FPGA uh, hardware resources as well as having access to SRIOV. And when it comes to runtimes, what I really would like to um, emphasize on is that beyond some of the traditional container runtimes, you can also use uh, both NVIDIA for acceleration as well as Kata containers. Kata containers happens to be an open source project and it is a highly secure as well as highly performant container runtime. So if you are not aware of that project, I would highly recommend to check it out. It is a fusion between containers and virtualization technologies. And with that, it is providing you with an actual isolation um, for your containers. So it is more secure and you can run your choice of kernel uh, independently from the host operating system in your container with Kata. So it is a, it is a really cool project. Um, when it comes to the deployment architectures, this slide really is just focusing on showing you how the active standby configuration is available in a Kubernetes deployment as well on your edge sites uh, or in the central cloud, wherever you're running containers. Um, so you have an active uh, Kubernetes master and the system is using floating IPs. And when something happens, you can switch over to the standby uh, Kubernetes master node and that's what your workers will be connected to. And again, um, the platform is um, also configured to mitigate split brain scenarios. Uh, Kubernetes and uh, the whole starting X platform is offering you the option to use Ceph as a, as a storage backend solution. So uh, it is configured for Kubernetes as well. And uh, you have the option to use uh, Rook as well. So you have the options to choose from various storage backends to configure with Ceph. And when it comes to persistent storage, if you're running OpenStack, then you can also use the OpenStack services such as Glance, Cinder, and Swift for block and object storage. For networking, um, some uh, cool projects are available integrated into the starting X platform. For instance, Calico, which is again, a well-known mature um, open source networking component. It is using standard solutions uh, and protocols like the border gateway protocol. Um, it is providing you with an L3 connectivity throughout the network and between the containers and um, Calico is also a highly scalable solution uh, with removing overhead such as overlays or tunnels or uh, VRF tables. 
when it comes to networking, uh, the community is putting high emphasis on making it as efficient and as highly performant as possible. So the Kubernetes accelerated networking really is all about uh, to utilize um, all what Multis, SRIOD, and DPDK can offer to you. So the containers are having direct access uh, to things like SRIOV and uh, the community is uh, working on to remove any additional hops. So again, direct access to um, the networking solutions as well as direct connection between the containers is what starting X networking um, offers to you. When it comes to um, the cloud component, uh, you get OpenStack and containers that I already talked about. So it means that the OpenStack control plane services are running in containers, while at the same time, the virtual machines are running on the host machine. Um, and starting X is using Helm and Helm charts to deploy these services and reconfigure them uh, dynamically when needed. And you get the um, core OpenStack services uh, that are providing you with the uh, compute storage and networking, um, as well as things like Keystone for identity management or Barbican for secrets, um, and Ironic for Bermuda um, hardware management. And when it comes to, again, those day two configuration uh, challenges, this is where containers and Helm um, is working for your advantage uh, to be able to do seamless configuration changes uh, whenever you need either configuration change or you're scaling in and out your infrastructure because of the needs of your workload. Distributed cloud is something that I pointed out earlier and I want to just touch on this a little bit. This is an implementation of this uh, distributed control plane configuration that I talked about at the beginning. And Starling X provides you with the opportunity to have control plane services available on the edge sites. And with that, um, you have a uh, fully managed and fully autonomous uh, infrastructure solution. So when it comes to the geographically distributed edge clouds, uh, if you have a connection loss, you will have a fully functional edge. You have a system controller um, in the central site that is connected through L3 with the edge sites, and the, uh, the starting X platform is providing you with all the, uh, the synchronization between sites. Um, once uh, you have the connection between them and the central cloud built back on. And, um, when it comes to uh, the distributed cloud component, um, what is a really cool feature in Starling X that it is providing you with a single pane of glass so you can see your whole infrastructure uh, centrally um, and be able to manage it centrally as well so you don't have to um, always go to every single edge site. Uh, either physically or logging in separately. You can manage everything from a, uh, a centralized uh, place, which is a Horizon dashboard in case of starting X. And you can see um, on the slide how you have uh, user management uh, synchronized as well as having access to the monitoring and fault information as well um, on that uh, single dashboard that you can use with starting X. Some information about the latest release um, to keep you even more excited about the, uh, the project. So the latest release of Starting X is the 7.0. It's being released in August 2022, so just about now. Um, the community, beyond maintaining all the functionality that I already talked about, is having a high focus on increasing scalability, security, as well as real-time functions. So um, you can see um, a list of some enhancements that I will be talking about a little bit later. And uh, distributed cloud, one really cool thing that the community is already uh, providing you as well is a local installation support, which means that you can manage uh, every site remotely and deploy them remotely. However, if you have the install media on site, then you can use that as well as a local installation and then connect that edge site 
to the central site later and with that you can reduce the amount of time and bandwidth that you're using uh, just to move the uh, install uh, components from the central site out to the edge. So uh, focusing a bit on the cool and interesting stuff, which is, for instance, real-time support, Starting X integrated the uh, Precision Time protocol in the 3.0 release. This is a standard protocol that is used to synchronize clocks in a computer network, which, as we all know, time is really cru crucial, not just for humans, but also computer systems. And with PTP, you can uh, reach a sub-microsecond range of accuracy in a local area network, which means that PTP can be used and it is widely used in financial transactions or synchronized mobile phone tower transmissions. And um, PTP is uh, having a reader follower architecture, so you have a grandmaster and you're synchronizing uh, system clocks in different ways when you're using the protocol. So the starting X community in the past couple of releases, including the 7.0 as well, is working on um, enhancing and improving the PTP support even further. So you can choose from configuration options like the timestamp mode or the network transport delay mechanism. And within 7.0, now you can have host specific configurations of PTP which means that you have way more flexibility in the system like you had before, so you don't have to have a system-wide configuration, but you can um, really um, pick and choose which PTP service you need on a host, and you can have a host-level configuration. So um, the component really is fine-tuned now to support uh, either 5G use cases or um, a factory floor with those really strict real-time requirements that I talked about. Um, the community is also always focusing on security enhancements. So um, they are um, adding a new Kubernetes uh, specific uh, component, pod security admission controller, as well as um, more fine grained support for audit logging in the system. And now, after the software, let's talk just a tad bit about uh, the community and contributing uh, before I ran out of time. So uh, the starting X community is following the four opens, uh, which, is, which are open community, open design, open development, and open source. What it really means in practice that this is an open and welcoming and friendly community who are encouraging you to come and participate and you have uh, access to the community, the design processes and development, and the source code as well. So um, you really are able to participate in the community to a full extent if you would like to. The community is structured around project teams and is governed by a technical steering committee. So if you have an interest in a specific area, you are able to reach out to and participate in a project team um, to um, help them maintain and enhance the components that you care about. You can get involved in various ways. I already mentioned that the source code is under Apache 2 license and you can reach the community on IRC or their mailing list uh, if you have any questions or if you're ready to come and contribute. You can either uh, file or solve a bug. You can um, introduce a new specification that introduces a new feature or functionality to the platform, and you can participate in the implementation and testing of all this, or you can just fix a documentation issue if you found one and you would like to uh, help the community with that. Uh, the community is having also weekly meetings beyond uh, the communication channels that they are using. So uh, I would highly encourage you to, for instance, pop by the TSC and community call on one of the Wednesdays uh, when the community is having those weekly calls. And where can you meet the community if you liked all this that I talked about today? Um, we are running a, a live show on Thursdays. It is called Opening for Life, where you can um, 
participate in the session, asking questions or sharing your opinion. Uh, these um, episodes are having uh, covering topics like um, cloud economics, sustainable computing, automation, all that you need to want to know about edge computing. So these are lively sessions with uh, updates from the open infra communities and you can um, enjoy sessions with industry experts and active contributors and we often have sessions that involve starting acts one way or the other. You can also meet the community in person because we are bringing back the Open Infra Project Teams Gathering event. It will happen um, in person in October in Columbus, Ohio. The registration is already open. This really is a community and contributor focused event. So uh, the project teams are discussing things like roadmap items, feedback uh, about the software, any bigger technical uh, architectural change to the software and really anything that is relevant to maintaining and enhancing the components that they are working on. The registration to the event is already open and we will be announcing the schedule soon so you can check out more details about the event on the uh, openingprodu.dev/ptg webpage. And with that, that was all the content that I had about starting X and edge computing for you today. Please reach out to me uh, either in email or in a direct message um, on any platform where you find me. Uh, if you have any questions or if you, you would like to follow up on anything that I said today. Um, and again, thank you for having me and I hope you will be enjoying the rest of the event and hope to see you somewhere in person soon. Thank you.